Hey, 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 hey. This is Julian Chambliss. Uh, I'm here with Scott French. We're in the Winter Park Public Library. Um, as you probably know, both Scott and I are really interested in local history. We're actually uh, working on a project together, sort of retelling the story of Winter Park. Uh, what I mean by that is, of course, we're, we've been contacted by the Chamber of Commerce um, to retell or redesign this sort of collective history story that they, that they use when they're sort of talking to people at Chamber events. So uh, they have an established story, but they contacted us to perhaps rethink that story in the context of a broader narrative that engages with uh, a more uh, broader context around the many different communities that make up Winter Park, I guess is the, the best way to say it. So we're here in the Winter Park Library and Archive to look at um, some records, right? One of the things that, of course, if you know anything about Winter Park politics and, and, and history in the recent contemporary period, there's been a lot of tension around uh, the question of displacement and gentrification in the West Side or Hannibal Square. This, of course, is the historic black community that was um, in the original plat plan for the city of Winter Park. Um, one of the things that we really sort of like made an emphasis on in this project, though, is sort of rediscovering all of those other neighborhoods and creating a, creating a more holistic narrative of the different neighborhoods that make up Winter Park. So one of the things that's come to the fore is, of course, that there are a number of post-World War II housing developments for African Americans that uh, happened in Winter Park as well, not just simply the foundational narrative associated with Hannibal Square, which at some level has, has gained a lot of uh, public attention in the last few years, but also this post-World War II period where you see um, that pent-up demand for housing where veterans are coming back from the war and thanks to the, the power of the GI Bill have access to uh, the terms that you know so well. I mean, these, these are actually the terms that define the modern housing, housing movement. That is uh, a small percentage down, 30-year loan. Uh, these are all federal housing association loans, and that's the GI Bill, sort of like transforming the housing market. But of course, African Americans weren't allowed into many of the housing developments that were being created in this period. Uh, we know this history well as historians, and we often talk about it in class, but the reality is, of course, for a lot of African American veterans, uh, if they try to move into white uh, subdivisions, assuming that the, the people who were putting up the subdivision would even allow them to, they often face violence and they often face the destruction of their property. It was a real battle for them to move into these places, even though they had access to the GI Bill as well. So uh, what you see is some innovation in terms of builders creating uh, black subdivisions in this, in this period. And one of the first black subdivisions, of course, is Washington Shores in Orlando, but we found evidence of two of the same sort of uh, black subdivisions in Winter Park. And one's called Carvertown, which I think many African Americans who are older are familiar with that. Uh, but another one is called Magnolia Garden. So we're going to flip the camera around and give you a chance to see the tax records because we're in the archives because we actually looking at the records because, like, hello, historians. <laughs> this um, is what we do on Saturdays. This is what we do on Saturdays. Right, like, right. Like, other people are out frolicly in the sun. Cleaning up debris in their yards. You're, that's well, what really yeah, well, well, that's true. But, but we're here in the archive because we already cleaned up the we debris. We cleaned in up the debris here. this morning. <laughs> so hold on a second, and we'll flip this around. All right. So what you're seeing is the tax roll for the city of Winter Park. The year is 1951. All right, so as you can see, this is the subdivision that we're talking about, a subdivision called Magnolia Gardens. And Scott, um, what would you say about um, some of the advertising and sort of narrative around Magnolia Gardens in Carvertown? So this is um, both Carvertown and Magnolia Gardens uh, are circa 1950, 51, and you see a number of display ads in the newspaper in the Orlando Sentinel for these, and they invariably are, are advertising and marketing themselves toward uh, colored veterans, uh, active servicemen, GIs, and defense workers. And what they're advertising is that veterans will get a lower down payment uh, they're open on veterans, but they're really understanding that this is a, a great market for them. And uh, so we, what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, what we've begun to do is uh, 
take these advertisements, find the plats for these neighborhoods, visit these neighborhoods, look at what the what's there today, you know, the original housing stock, and beginning to record some of the stories of people who remember uh, these neighborhoods from the early days. And, and then thinking, too, about what the where they are today and the kind of threat of gentrification. And maybe, Julian, you could say a few more words about what's going on now. Well, one of, one of the things, of course, you know, any sort of, like, contemporary narrative about Winter Park in the last few years, of course, is going to talk about uh, displacement associated with uh, development, um, which we commonly call gentrification. I often don't use that word because uh, I feel like it's inaccurate. A displacement is a better word because there are people there uh, and the vagaries of the market and, in particular, the imbalance of the housing market uh, are, are pushing them out, right? Um, and pushing here is, is uh, I think, I, I know for a lot of people, loaded language. But what you see happening, of course, is uh, those people who are looking for opportunity to develop, developers looking for opportunity to develop, are looking to the west side because of the profitability of acquiring property there and combining those lots, which are single-family lots, as you would expect in a, in a park, is very common sort of single-family lot structure. Uh, and putting those together and create a higher density uh, new construction uh, for people who are looking for the opportunity to sort of partake in the Winter Park experience and especially um, taking advantage of Winter Park Central location along Sun Rail. And, and this has been something you can see when you look at the sort of like layout of the town, uh, especially over the last few years. Uh, this transformation, of course, is part and parcel of broader transformation taking place in the, in the housing market on a global scale often talk about students that there's a global imbalance in the housing market in terms of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And this question of affordability is not just simply about African Americans, it's affordability in terms of simply working class people like school teachers, policemen, nurses. Uh, when we talk about workforce housing and the terms that we use to talk about um, the cost problem for housing, um, that imbalance is part of, part of the story. Uh, but of course, the relative value of property owned by people of color and, and uh, working poor uh, makes it uh, an appealing space for a new development, right? Uh, we can, the developers can acquire that property and they are buying the property uh, and then turn around and, as I say, rezone that property and create new housing stock that they can sell to residents who are looking to look, live closer to a place like Park Avenue, a little closer to a, an appealing location like downtown went apart, right? We, we see similar narratives associated with this in, in places like um, the Milk District off Bumby Avenue, right? Like at some very basic level, rents in the Milk District have increased in part because Lake Eola is a, a sort of well-established and expensive neighborhood and people looking to the uh, developers looking for opportunity have moved a little bit over into the Milk District and started to build new housing there and that's increased the rents, right? And as you can see, as you probably read about uh, in the last few months, um, this has created tension around um, the rent and tensions around uh, this little housing profile in the Milk District. So that's a, a microcosm of this whole process, and that's the same process that you you would argue, you could see in a place like Hannibal Square. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Scott was talking about this earlier um, about the hurricane mm -hmm. and uh, having visited Magnolia Gardens. Just driving by um, because we've been looking looking at it in terms of like the primary sources, but he actually hopped in his car and drove over. And you made a really great point about um, this is a community that started really was platted out in like 1950 uh, and built in 1951. Mm -hmm. um, but this recent hurricane uh, had a really sort of defining. Yeah. Um, Effect. So, you know, I just I drove through and it had a beautiful house right on the corner. So I took a picture of that because it, it almost looked like a showpiece. Um, and then I drove in and, you know, I have a picture of this in my mind from the plat. And I said, oh, here's Carver Court. I'm going to drive down Carver Court. It's a cul-de-sac. I get to the end of the cul-de-sac. Giant tree had obviously fallen on one of the houses and in all the pieces had been piled up in the yard of another. It, it was as if if I'd been there three days before. I would have seen, you know, a neighborhood that had survived, you know, houses that had survived from the 50s and, and, and you know, were still occupied. Uh, they were, they looked like they were in really, you know, they'd really been damaged by the storm. So, 
you know, it, was, it just was sort of a, a thing when, you, when you're doing history like this to go out and connect with it in that way. Uh, you know, you might think about, well, what is the cost of removing trees? You know, how much those trees were were large. It costs, I've heard quotes of 3000 sometimes right, yeah. $4,000 to remove a large tree that threatens your property. So these neighborhoods are vulnerable to all kinds of uh, right. destructive forces. Right, because as lower, so like working right. working class neighborhoods, do they have um, those what you can resources to remove a tree? Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, that's the sort of like hidden cost of like relative values around property that's really important when we when we talk about um, sort of wealth and vis-a-vis -vis minority communities versus uh, non-minority minority communities. So is that sort of thing that like uh, sort of we're puzzling out even as we look as as we said um, at the actual plat map. Uh, in a lot of ways, the Magnolia Garden story is a really important story that sort of helps fill in the gaps about the sort of post-war experience for African Americans in terms of the housing market at the local level. We 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 both know plenty of scholars who sort of talk about this in broad swaths in terms of like the national level. Mm -hmm. But actually one of the things that you know most historians would, would talk would talk to you about is trying to fill in the gaps of that at the local level. Is is these sort of patterns that we, we talk about mm -hmm. Um, in bigger, well-known municipalities in, yeah. in, in, in the Northeast and the Midwest, are they persistent or are they similar in the South? And really, at some level, this work uh, sort of like points to some some similarities, but also yeah. some some subtle differences. And that's one of the things they're really trying to to bring to the fore. So, yeah. Um, yeah well, yeah. I have one other thing. I, I think in terms of helping Winter Park tell a more complete, inclusive story, our strategy for this was to find. Uh, two subdivisions, one white, both segregated, one white segregated by restrictive covenants and right. one African American, uh, which boomed after World War II. So and the white yeah. subdivision is, is Virginia Heights, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, in some ways a historic, you know, it is, it is, it is historic. historic. It's, it's one a, of the two, two historic, with College yeah. Quarter and Virginia Heights are the two historic, only two historic districts, right? right yeah. Residential areas in Winter Park. So. Uh -huh. We wanted to look at Virginia Heights and uh, take sort of side by side with Carvertown, which is the other African American subdivision, and uh, think about opportunity, how people experience growing up in these places. And I have to add to this, and Julian and I have to discuss this a lot, that the the people who the white residents who grew up in Virginia Heights, their story has not been included in the Winter Park narrative. That that's a kind of left out piece of the story, right? right yeah. Um, so it's in some ways we're also we're looking at this middle class uh, that you know the story of Winter Park has often been about the founders, the great philanthropists, the great institutions, the the beauty, the culture, right. um, not m so much about the people who lived and worked here, and maybe were part of the the businesses that sprang up to serve that wealthier class. Right. So it's, you know, in many ways, it's, it's inclusive. It's more inclusive in, in a lot of ways, and I think that's exciting for us to be able to contribute to that. Yeah, one of the things that we um, wanted to do was really think about this idea of the subdivision as a sort of defining narrative for one part, right? Because, of course, very famously, at one point, the slogan for the city was City of Homes. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about it, um, the sort of classic narrative used to describe the city, is not everybody's home? It's really sort of only like a few historic homes. And that was one of the things as sort of like people steeped in social history that were like, well, if if this this idea of the city of homes is really defining, and it is in a lot of ways, like this still remains, I think one of the things that defines Winter Park as a community it is a city of homes. Mm -hmm. um, then what about all those subdivisions? What are they even called? And a lot of yeah. people don't realize like what the subdivisions are called. Mm -hmm. So just finding the names of the subdivisions has been a little bit of a hunt. Um, so put it aside, like, yeah, we, dis we discovered sort of like these sort of African-American subdivisions, but I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a lot of people who understand the names of the subdivision that they live in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an original name, right? And so that's one of the things that, that we're sort of running down. And when the final, final process is done, uh, you'll get to sort of like hear some of these original names mm -hmm. and see how they morph, right? Because, you know, places like Villa Tuscany, yeah. uh -huh, um, that's part of a bigger subdivision. Right, um, and so those are the kind of stories that we're hoping to, to bring to the fore. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you're looking, you're probably looking at this later. Uh, we're also doing uh, something called 
um, Saturday school today. Today is Saturday. Uh, it's a social justice teaching. It's sort of virtual online. So if you uh, go on Twitter and look for the hashtag Saturday school and the hashtag so just cities so s o j u s t c i t i e s um you can find um uh, both scott and myself tweeting about uh the city and history and planning and um some of the issues sort of defined around understanding that stuff uh but we of course had to take the opportunity to sort of like delve into this uh look into the archives so um uh, thanks for watching and um of course you'll see us on the internet we're always on the internet. Yeah. Scott, especially, is always on oh, the I'm internet. Always there. Yeah, he's always I live there. there. Yeah, yeah. He's a virtual man. <laughs> Later.